We talked about using the variation method to solve the Schrodinger equation for molecules that have more than one electron. We ended up with the secular equations and uh, we then were able to get the, the determinant of the coefficients in the secular equations, set that equal to zero, solve for energy, put the energies back into the secular equations and get the coefficients. Uh, you might remember that that had quite a few, let's just go back up here and see if we can uh, see that. There are quite a few terms here. For instance, uh, here's a secular equation. If you have n unknowns, you'll have n of these equations, and each equation or each coefficient, these are the mixing coefficients, will have um, associated um, multiplier here. So you would get fairly complex equations, or not complex, but fairly large set of equations with lots of coefficients here. Well, what Huckel decided to do, uh, not pronouncing that right, I uh, don't know German, Huckel, I guess, uh, what Huckel <laughs> would uh, uh, propose to do back in the 1930s was to apply some various simplifications. And here are the simplifications he used. Now, he applied it to conjugated systems. Conjugated systems. Well, what's a conjugated system? So let's take an example. Let's take C, double bond C, single bond C, double bond C, single bond C, double bond C. When you have alternating single, double bonds, you have a conjugated system. We put in the hydrogens here. Each, hi uh, each carbon is sp3 hybrid, sp2 hybridized. So this is um, sp2 hybridized, meaning you have an atomic p orbital left over on the carbon. So just let's write that here, and when you do sp3 hybridization, the atomic p orbital comes up. So Huckel said, all right, I'm just going to look at these conjugated systems, and my basis set is going to be the carbon p orbitals, the atomic carbon p orbitals uh, that were not involved in hybridization. So Huckel, for this case, you have six carbons, you have six atomic p orbitals. Assumption two was that there was no overlap of adjacent p orbitals. So remember the Sij, uh, these are the overlap integrals where uh, i is the uh, orbital on one atom and j is the orbital on another atom, for example. Well, he's saying that if you look at Sij for adjacent um, p orbitals, Sij, that's equal to zero. And furthermore, he says SII, so you just look at the overlap of the orbital with itself, that's equal to 1. I guess I didn't write that in, so, oh yes, I did. This is the uh, Kronecker delta symbol, which we may or may not be familiar with. Just let me write it over here. Delta IJ is equal to one of two things. It's equal to 0 if I is not equal to J and is equal to 1 if i is equal to j. So what we're saying here is that unless i equal j, uh, the overlap integral is 0. If i is equal to j, then the overlap integral is equal to 1. And that corresponds to ignoring the overlap between these atomic p orbitals. Uh, it's a fairly drastic assumption, but we'll go ahead and do that. Uh, Huckel was making various approximations so he could solve the Schrodinger equation and the secular equations very easily. All right, here's another assumption. Hij is equal to zero for p orbitals are not adjacent. So if you look at this orbital and this orbital, all right, Hij, remember, maybe we should just define these down here. Sij was this integral, psi i, psi j, where these are basis set functions. And Hij is this integral here, where you have psi i Hamiltonian H psi j. So that was just shorthand notation. So what Huckel's saying is that that integral, Hij, is not equal to zero if you have uh, adjacent p orbitals. But if you don't have adjacent p orbitals, if you go, say, from uh, the first orbital here all the way to the third, in this case, h uh, i j is equal to 0. This would be h 1, 2 if we label the orbitals 1, 2, 3, 4, 
5, and 6. So H12 is not equal to 0, and H13 is equal to 0. All right, so just ignoring uh, anything other than adjacent orbital. So this would have two values. You would have an uh, Hij for this, and also have an Hij for this. All right. Uh, then you change um, nomenclature, make the assumption that this uh, HII is a constant and call that alpha. So if you look at HII, well, let's do, for instance, take something new here. This is a sixth atomic p orbital. So H66, that's equal to H55, which is equal and so on, is equal to H11. In other words, these are all the same if you just look at um, the orbital, Hamiltonian orbital of itself. And we're going to call that equal to alpha. Okay, and then Hij, where we just have adjacent, so this is H12, that's equal to H23, which is equal to H34, uh, which is equal to H45, uh, which is equal to H56, and then, uh, and that's equal to H21, equal, etc., etc., you get the idea. Those are all equal, and we're going to call that beta. All right. So uh, those are the assumptions in the Huckel molecular orbital theory. And you can then identify these parameters alpha and beta. For instance, alpha would be the ionization potential, the methyl radical. So that's what you're going to call alpha. And beta is the stabilization when you have parallel p orbitals. All right, so just sort of relate that to uh, something you can measure experimentally. All right, so let's see what uh, these assumptions, these simplifying assumptions mean to our secular equation. Here is the uh, secular equation. Actually, this is the determinant you get from the secular equation. And you have to uh, uh, calculate out the determinant and solve for E. All right, let's just see. Uh, Sij equal delta Ij. So it's equal to 1 if I equals J. It's equal to 0 otherwise. So, okay, this can be equal to 1. That goes to 0. That goes to 0. That goes to 0. This is equal to 1. That goes to 0. Oh, so that's kind of cool. So we're going to have a whole bunch of things that are 0. That goes to um, 0. Only when uh, i equal j are you going to have something, and that's going to equal 1. This will go to 0. And this will go to 0. All right, so we made some simplifications with that. And then we're saying Hij equal 0 for p orbitals that are not adjacent. All right, so if they're not adjacent, uh, this means that, well, 2 and n, this is not adjacent, so that's 0. That's 0. Uh, this means that um, uh, all these off diagonal terms, n1, that's 0. Uh, that's zero and so on. So, oh, we got a lot of zeros in here. And then we'll just call uh, HII um, to be alpha. So I'll call this alpha. I'll call this beta. We'll call this beta. We'll call this alpha. Okay, so maybe you can see that this now uh, comes out to be fair, um, not I know it's fairly simple, but this would be like, oh, I should change my pen color, sorry. A black on blue is not a great color, so let me change that to white. So I'll just rewrite this with the Huckel simplifying assumptions. This would be alpha minus E. This would be beta. And all the rest of these things will be zero, dot, dot, dot. And down here will be beta. This would be alpha minus E. So note that all these alphas, these diagonal H11, H22, and so on, are all equal. 0, 0, and so on. This would be 0. This would be beta. This would be alpha minus E. Um, beta, okay, and what do we have here? This would be beta, sorry. And all these are zeros. These would be zeros. This would be beta, and so on that determinant has to equal 
zero. So now we have to solve a determinant that has lots of zeros in it. So when we're actually calculating those things, uh, it'll be easy. All right, so that's the uh, Huckel molecular orbital theory. Again, just conjugated systems apply just to the p, so the p orbitals are the basis set. You make these simplifying assumptions, and you get a determinant that has lots of zeros in it. So when you go to calculate the determinant, a lot of those terms will be zero. All right, we're going to apply Huckel molecular, molecular orbital theory to butadiene.